Good day. Today we're going to conduct a brief uh, item analysis of the Module 3 assessment in CSC 220. Uh, this is in uh, fall of 2021. Uh, we have an average score of 4.19. Uh, 13 questions were considered easy and 9 were considered could not calculate or poor, likely due to the mastery learning where um, all the students answered correctly and answered in the same manner. So in terms of the statistical analysis that Blackboard performs on assessment items, it would say, well, there's very poor discrimination for those cases, but uh, algorithms in Blackboard are not necessarily designed with mastery learning in mind. Uh, we had three medium and two hard questions and uh, most of the difficulty levels for the questions were rated as easy, but we did have a few medium and, and hard, and that's, that's acceptable for a first attempt. What we'd like to do is order these by the uh, most challenging for students, and here you're, you'll see that every student got the uh, matching item correct, uh, because the average score was a uh, half a point, and this item was worth a half a point, so everybody maxed out. But we'll go ahead and start with the most challenging and work our way down through until we get <clears throat> further down to where the uh, questions were answered completely correct, um, except for the multiple answer. Here's one that uh, should have been a 0.5. Um, so we'll jump down to the bottom to look at ordering and multiple answer. The first question it posed a challenge for students in this uh, module assessment was uh, a question about um, you're a member of a business continuity planning team. That's what BCPT stands for. And are presented a resource that will allow essential workers to continue work following a natu natural disaster. Prior to adopting use of this resource, what are some critical criteria that must also be satisfied or valid while disaster conditions remain in effect in order for this to be a viable alternative. Now that that phrase, while disaster conditions remain in effect, is, is an important consideration. So uh, as you're looking at the uh, criteria here, you want to think, okay, I'm using this Windows 365 uh, cloud PC while disaster conditions remain in effect. Choose any answer that apply. So <clears throat> these three answers were the correct alternatives. A method of adequate payment to provision this resource must be accessible until regular systems are restored. Uh, Windows 365 is available on a monthly basis. You pay each month for what you use and you have to be able to use uh, electronic payment uh, terms online. Suitable mobile devices must be available to operate and connect reliably to the internet to access Microsoft 365. It's out in the cloud in the public internet so it's not a good option for continuing business operations. That's what business continuity is all about. That's where the C is. Um, you have to have devices that are working and can connect to the internet. The same application you applications used routinely must be preloaded onto the Windows 365 virtual system. So simply having Windows 365, a virtual PC in the cloud, is great if you can connect to it with a tablet or a smartphone that can get on the internet. But what happens if you're supposed to be using Excel or PowerPoint or Word or your Outlook, and none of that software is loaded into the virtual PC. So in order for the business to continue, while it's also working hard over time to recover the losses, it has to keep, uh, it has to keep paying the bills, right? Uh, these last two options, it says promptly clear approval for use of the new resource with the IRPT and incident responders. Well, 
the IRPT is the Incident Response Planning Team, and they don't have anything to do with co the continuity um, interests following a natural disaster or a major event. Um, th their primary concern is responding to the initial incident. So it would be irrelevant for them to look at it. This last item, update and revise the business impact analysis to include use of this new resource. Um, the business impact analysis has to do with anticipated gaps. And so if you're, uh, you're talking about what happens if everything else fails, um, and you don't know if you're going to be able to use this afterwards in a disaster. So it's not like you would change the business impact analysis. This is an earlier planning task uh, before you do IR planning, before you do disaster recovery planning, before you do business continue continuity planning. So <clears throat> um, basically what you'd be doing is um, kind of like cheating and altering the conditions and going back and revising everything. Um, you might update the business impact analysis if after use of this resource, following a natural disaster, uh, there were lessons learned and you're refining. But that wouldn't happen before its use and it wouldn't happen in order, it wouldn't happen while the disaster conditions remain in effect. So that, once again, that condition makes a big difference. So you would not select this one. These last two would be left unselected. Okay. <clears throat> I know that was a complex scenario. Uh, this next item was also a challenge. It's a multiple choice item. Effective continuity planning or contingency planning programs should include a blank who is a high level manager to support, promote, and conduct unplanned drills that result in continuous improvement. Richard Riscorla, Rick Riscorla, is prominently featured. We mentioned this in class. Uh, I made a big splash of this. I explained it. You know, he was a gentleman that saved, you know, over a thousand people in Morgan Stanley when the World Trade Center was hit by terrorists. And it was Rick Riscorla. So you need a champion, basically. Now, there is a phrase that's similar that has to do um, with an executive in charge, but it's really about the CEO. Um, and that's a different that's a different component but overall if, if you're going to have a program uh, that's going to work you need somebody that's going to be the spark plug or the soul of that program that's going to motivate and promote and get in there and there were uh, there was more than one link and reference in the study guide and the addendum um, to Rick Riscorla and there were different references, and it was also plainly stated in the study guide also. So, just remember, Rick Riscorla saved over a thousand lives. All right, uh, this multiple choice item posed a challenge. It said the maximum amount of time that a system resource can remain unavailable before there is an unacceptable impact on other system resources that's called the recovery time objective. Uh, that's plainly stated in the definitions in your addendum. So that's pretty straightforward. This item in fill in the blank, it said business blank analysis is a preparatory activity common to both contingency planning and risk management programs. In our previous module, we covered risk management, but then when we started talking about contingency planning or incident handling, incident handling and contingency planning, we said that you take the outputs of risk management and use them with contingency planning. 
business impact analysis is common to both processes. So impact is one of the answers that you needed to put in here. BIA, if you, if you were thinking of the acronym and you also put in BIA, you would have also received credit. But um, the, the missing word here is impact. Okay, so now we're getting to uh, scores that were nearly correct. We'll cover these last three, and then we'll jump to the bottom. Even private and nonprofit organizations, this is a true-false question. Even private and nonprofit organizations in the U.S. Virgin Islands are required to protect data and related systems if engaged in federal contracts, grants, collaborations, or support per standards established by NIST, a division of the U.S. Department of Commerce. That is true. We've stated that verbatim uh, in class. Not sure why that's not registering completely. It doesn't make any sense. Everyone answered that correctly. It's showing an average score of 0.21. It should be 0.25. That must be a mistake. And the algorithm, because everybody answered it correctly. Um, the next true-false item. Uh, this one did have a different answer. So the the statement reads: crisis management is another term for disaster recovery, the management of unexpected challenges brought on by natural or man-made events. No, that's the definition of contingency planning. It's right out of your book and out of the study guide and out of the appendix, the, um, the addendum with definitions. So that is false. Okay, last one we'll check, multiple choice. And then we'll uh, zip down to the bottom. The question reads, the transfer of transaction data. So the moment you see transaction, you're talking about databases and something called remote journaling, uh, if it's done off-site. So the transfer of transaction data in real time to an off-site facility is called remote journaling. So a journal is an extra log of transactions that are occurring to customer records or client records or patient records, take your pick, um, or sale records, depending on the nature of the database. And as those records are being updated with recent activity, uh, like, like think about credit cards, purchases and and payments and so on. Those are transactions to a given record. Those are journaled or logged, and if it's offsite, that's remote. Offsite storage, uh, no one. Electronic vaulting, that's a separate um, concept that doesn't have to do with real time transaction data stored off offsite. That's a totally separate thing. Let's look at the uh, final items. Multiple answer and ordering that posed a challenge for students. So the multiple answer question reads, you will train tech staff as first responders, incident handlers for cyber events, also known as um, digital evidence first responders, DEFR. Now, forensic people are referred to as digital evidence specialists, or DES. This is a reference that we've had or made in previous modules. Anyway, you want them to know which discoveries always require immediate action. And we went, went out of our way and made a big splash to explain uh, a little bit of dissatisfaction with some of the publisher materials. And, and then I, I claimed this thing where I said, you know, policy violations are, are basically the local law of the organization. 
And whenever anybody violates a written standard established by an authority of the organization, that always requires immediate action. Unless um, you're unprofessional and uh, your standards are inadequate and you're incompetent. All of the above, right? So if you're going to be working in cybersecurity and a company has a policy, and it's clear that the digital evidence uh, clearly reflects a violation of written standard, that you, you've got to call that out. You can't just log it in a book and then file it in a report later. You have to stop and say, hey, it looks like somebody's violated your policy. Uh, I'm sure you're going to want to spin up uh, human resources and potentially um, legal consultation if that's you know as needed, depending on the nature of the violation. If there's disciplinary action with an employee, there can be lawsuits. So whenever you have something in writing that's serious, if it proves a criminal law has been violated, uh, that's also an issue. Now, shows a user is non-compliant for essential standards. Well, essential standards um, are not the same as policies. So standards are recommended practices. They're often called best practices. And um, those are not mandatory. So if somebody violates something that isn't mandatory, it doesn't re always require immediate action. That's one way to think of it. Indicates unethical activity using systems or data. So it's not illegal. It may not be a matter of policy violation, but it's, it's wrong. Well, that, that could be a matter of debate. That's something that's going to take some review, but it doesn't, it doesn't require a hard stop. It doesn't require immediate action on the part of the incident handler, right? Um, if somebody's violating policy and there's written policy, those are in place for a good reason. And that means you have an active violation of something that's a written requirement. And, and that, can, that can cause serious harm to an organization, uh, either to their reputation or their operating capacity. All right, so one last item. It was an ordering item. This ordering item reflects the steps that you took to perform the solution uh, by the number. So essentially, you're, you have been directed to investigate suspicious conditions on a running system with an active login. That's S Corinth, right there. Order your actions according to best practices. Well, the first step is to obtain a record of permission to unlock the screen See, if you're cutting in on somebody's active login, it's important for a local authority to provide a record, a written record, that it's, you're authorized to go in there and, and get in their Kool-Aid. And that's just that's kind of an uh, ethical principle. Uh, certified ethical hackers basically have to do things in writing a lot. Um, second step is to coordinate a change of password to a temporary value. Uh, you don't want to tip off uh, the user if there's an issue, especially if there's suspicious stuff going on. So the keywords there are suspicious conditions. That means if you're investigating and there's a perpetrator in the mix, you don't want to tip off the perpetrator. Um, the only way to do that, if you start trying to use any particular login to unlock the system, you're going to lock it out uh, with multiple attempts to get in there. Or if you just log them out, um, they'll say, hey, I didn't leave the system like this. And that's the first sign to them that something is up, something's going on. You know, this, hey, this screen isn't the way I left it. Uh, capture views of open applications. So you're going, as soon as you are in the system, you will notice uh, oftentimes a series of open applications that are plainly displayed in view. You want to capture images of those. If you had a digital camera or if you had a way of capturing a screenshot remotely where you did not change the active memory on the remote system, then that would also be suitable, which is why we performed the tasks the way we did. Um, 
lacking a camera and a real physical scenario that everybody could do. If we had a lab, we could set it up like that. Capture views of minimum so of minimized software. So if you don't have open windows, you probably have running applications on the bottom of the taskbar that you can select just to display and then minimize again with the same same click. Um, those active uh, applications are are important to capture. The last step is to restore screen elements and lock the screen. You don't want to, you want to leave the system in the active state. Now, when the user comes back and they try to log in and it says their password's no good, they're going to contact the help desk and you have already coordinated in advance and hopefully the help desk staff know to refer that individual's request to someone who has a very uh, well-practiced, very uh, smooth way of explaining, oh, we were working some, um, some system assessments and transitions. Um, we'll get that straight for you right away. Um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a temporary password, and then as soon as you log in, you can um, enter a new password to reset your password, right? So... That's, that's the order uh, that, that uh, this should follow uh, in, those, in those steps, right? So obtain a record, coordinate a change of password, capture the view of open applications, capture the views of closed applications, restore the screen, and lock the system. Leave it the way you found it. That's it. This concludes our item analysis of our module assessment. Um, please reconcile promptly and uh, good luck on your final attempt. This concludes our review.